Show nine o'clock. Here we go. Welcome to Under New Management. My name is Terry Cotterman, and welcome everybody to the show. Our co-host Gary Evans. How you doing, Gary? Good morning. Doing great. Good to see you. Good it's to see been, you all out there. It's been a while, right? Yes. <laughs> Well, today we are going to discuss the rapture of the church, which is in scripture and which many, many scholars, theologians, pastors say this will be the next prophetic event according to scripture that's going to take place. We've been saying we're living in the last days, right, Gary? People have been saying we've been living the last days since John the Apostle wrote uh, Second, Third John, and uh, even Peter quotes that in Acts two when he gives that uh, famous uh, dissertation uh, when the Holy Spirit descends upon them on the day of Pentecost, and uh, we've been living the last days since then. But a lot of Scripture also points to the last days, the time that we're living in when Israel's returned to the land. And the culmination of questions that disciples asked Jesus in Matthew 24, 25, Luke 17, uh, well, where's the promise you're coming? What, what are the end times? They asked Jesus, uh, when, what's going to happen? And here we are now, 2,000 years later, watching lots of things happening all at once. And one of those things that, as Terry mentioned, that is coming up is the rapture of the church. And what, what is the rapture? Because if you look at the King James Bible, the word rapture is not in it. But there is a word called harpazo, which is the great snatching up uh, that as we discussed uh, coming into the word of God, if looking at the New Testament book of First Thessalonians. Paul writes to the Thessalonians, I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, or in essence, people who have passed away, that you sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them which are asleep in Jesus will God bring with him. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and with the trump of God and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. And then Paul says, comfort one another with these words. So we have an event occurring where apparently when Paul was ministering to the people in Thessalonica, which is over there in the area of, of modern day Greece, they were wondering what's going to happen in some of the, their company believers back then had passed away. And so now they're like, uh, they died before the return of the Lord. And so Paul ministers them and says, Hey, those that are have passed away that are asleep uh, will be called up first. And then we are alive and we're caught up in the air. So here's the thing that I look at is that, we go by cemeteries. I remember my dad is uh, saying, you no know, dad jokes. And you'd pass by some of the older cemeteries that are all marble and stone. And his dad joke was, you see that place over there? You go, we got dad. And people are dying to get in there. <laughs> and I call a cemetery an early warning rapture system. Because in most places in the world, people are buried six feet down. Why are people buried six feet down? But supposedly dogs and wolves and other carnivorous things can smell dead, rotting flesh up to like five and a, five and a half feet down. At least that's what I was told growing up. And so you're six feet under. That way they can't dig your body back up. So just imagine this thing that is scoffed at today. That when the rapture occurs, the Bible says the trump of God shall sound. And those that are dead... But believe in the Lord, the cemeteries are going to explode and caskets are going to open up and they're going to be caught up. And then we, which are alive and remain, shall be caught up in the air to meet the Lord in the air. And you're thinking, that's a bunch of hogwash. 
Well, then you think about 1 Corinthians. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, Paul writing to the Corinthians, he says, now I say this to you, this is 1 Corinthians 15, 5, 0, 1, 5, chapter 15, starting from verse 15. Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, neither does corruption inherit in corruption. And what are we? Even though when you become a believer in Jesus Christ, you're a redeemed person trapped in this body of sin and death in, in the flesh. So Paul writes, behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, not might sound, could sound, said shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruption must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible shall put on incorruption and this mortal shall put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your sting? O grave, where is your victory? The sting of death is sin and the strength of this sin is the law. But thanks to be God, which gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved, beloved brethren, be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. So when you look at the Bible, scripture interprets scripture. Yeah. And I've heard it said that the twinkle of an eye is like three, three thousandths of a second, faster than you and I can blink. And so you're going to hear a trump sound. But another thing that's interesting is in the book of Revelation, chapter four, verse one, it says that I, I, John, was in the spirit on the Lord's day. So let's say a Sunday. And he suddenly hears a voice say, get up here. And boom, he was in the throne room of God. So in the first three chapters of Revelation, there's the, the seven letters to seven churches. And that, again, is the revelation singular. You hear a lot of people say, I read revelations, but it's revelation singular of Jesus Christ given to John the apostle to the letter to the seven churches. But after revelation verse chapter four, verse two, you don't hear about the church anymore. It's all back about the Jews. So if you think about the gospels and especially like the day that Jesus was baptized by John the Baptist, the believers heard a clear voice. This is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. But the gospels indicate that the people around heard something supposing it was thunder. So on a day coming and could be very soon, but that's a whole other discussion itself of what is soon is because we've been waiting on the Lord for 2000 years as the church. We're going to hear a noise. We're going to hear a trumpet. We're going to hear a voice say, get up here. And the harpazo, the great snatch will occur and will be transformed in a moment in a twinkle of an eye and will be in the presence of the Lord. So the next question you have is why in the air? Why is God going to, you know, blow these whole, the, all these graves open and, and then we're going to be changed from mortal to mortal? Well, what does the Bible say about Satan? He's the prince of the power of the air. And to me, it's Jesus going nerny, nerny, nerny to Satan because we're going to be changed and now we're going to be multidimensional just like Jesus is. And Jesus is going to look over at Satan in the air and Satan's going to be going, ah, it happened. And Jesus is going to look at him. And before Arnold did it, Jesus is going to say, I'll be back. And then Jesus is going to take us to wherever the, the Bema seat judgment is in heaven. And then the great wedding uh, supper of the lamb where the Jesus and the bride of Christ, us, the church, are, are joined in, in marriage, if you will. And that's during the seven-year tribulation period that's going to happen here on earth. That has to be started, in essence, by the rapture. Because the Bible also says that elsewhere in Thessalonians, he who now lets will let until he be removed. And then that wicked one be revealed, the son of perdition. So if he who lets... Now let's is the Holy Spirit, and we, the church, are the containers of the Holy Spirit. The church has to be removed to allow this 
coming world leader, most commonly known as the Antichrist, to be revealed. So the Bible, again, interpreting scripture, if the rapture doesn't happen, and there's lots of people today scoffing at the idea of a rapture because they call it escapism. And I've talked with people that they don't like the rapture. They don't agree with the rapture because rapturitis is kind of an American thing because what persecution have you and I gone through, Terry? What persecution? We haven't. What persecution? No, we don't know what persecution is. We've been made fun of. We've been scoffed. We've been mocked. But Yeah, but, you know, we don't know what persecution is. There's people in China that are being shot in the back of the head for the relief in Jesus. There's people in Islamic countries are getting tortured and killed excuse me and so you know our persecution is if we got to wait in line in in and out or yeah if you're somewhere else in the country cracker barrel you don't get your order right (laughs) we we don't know what persecution is so the people who mock the rapture do so because we don't know what persecution is in our country we've had it good we've had it too good you know we, we can Walk out of our house. Uh, there's dozens of fast food restaurants from hamburgers and burgers to Mexican to Chinese, Vietnamese, Thai, um, got Tex-Mex, uh, the Persian food, you name it. You know, you go to supermarket, you can go to Costco and Walmart and Sam's Club and the place is full of stuff. We don't know what persecution is. You, you every day can hop in a bathtub or a shower with hot running water and a toilet to flush when other places in the world, um, they've got cardboard uh, floors and, and corrugated steel roofs and, and brick uh, buildings, yeah. we don't know what persecution is. No. But during the tribulation, when we're gone, Satan also bangs on us, bags on us. And if you go to Revelation 13, it says that in in this you know, other comment that apparently the guy who's the Antichrist may or may not be assassinated because somebody's going to figure out who he is and try to kill him. And since Satan always has to copy what Jesus does, uh, this guy's going to assassinate because they say that I saw a wound, a deadly wound. Revelation 13, 3 says, I saw one of his heads as it were wounded to death. And his deadly wound was healed, and all the world wondered after the beast. And they worshipped the dragon, which gave power into the beast. And they worshipped the beast, saying, Who is like unto the beast? Who is able to make war with him? And there was given unto him a mouth, speaking great things and blasphemies. And power was given unto him to continue 42 months. Well, you do the math, 42 months is three and a half years. And the tribulation period is seven years. And there's a space of three and a half years. And then apparently this guy is going to go into the rebuilt temple in Jerusalem, which hasn't been rebuilt yet. But as we showed you pictures in our earlier shows, they've got the stuff ready. It could be rebuilt. And then there's a thing called the Ark of the Covenant. If you remember the Indiana Jones first movie, Raiders of the Lost Ark, that's a real thing. That's set in the temple of God, the, the of Solomon. And this coming world leader known as the Antichrist and go in there and declare himself to be God. Well, in that time frame, it says in Revelation 13, 6, is that he opened his mouth in blasphemy against God to blaspheme God's name, his tabernacle, because there's a copy of the tabernacle in heaven that's on earth. And then it says, blaspheme them that dwell in heaven. Well, if the rapture doesn't occur, and we're not up there. Why does the Bible, which is famous for its detail and also its brevity, have this one verse in there that the beast, which is a man filled with Satan, Satan indwells this guy, and he's going to blaspheme us in heaven if we're not there. So to me, that's another rapture proof that we're there. The church is rescued prior to the Fecal matter here in the air rotation device, if you will. And we are escaped from the tribulation. Jesus said, pray that you miss that hour of trial and tribulation that is going to come on the planet. So to me, there's current 
things that prove the Bible uh, and the rapture happening, but there's also previous types in the Bible that would indicate the rapture occurring. And do you know who that would be, Terry? Who? A guy named Enoch, <laughs> which we find in Genesis chapter, go to this thing, Genesis chapter 5. So this is the Old Testament, correct? This is the Old Testament. Yeah. And Enoch is part of the line of Jesus. And what's neat, and you can look this up, the seven, eight first big names in the Bible, Adam uh, to Noah. Uh, so it's Adam, Seth, Enoch, uh, Jared, somebody else, Methuselah, and Noah. Long way around says something that God saw sinful, despairing man and did something to give them rest. Noah means rest. Mm. So God came down knowing man's sinful condition. And I think it's provided a savior that man who believes in him would have rest. And we can have rest in Jesus because he did pay the ultimate price for us, dying on the cross for our sins that we could have eternal fellowship with him. Yeah. But it talks about this Enoch guy in the line, this line uh, prior to the flood. And in Genesis 5, 24, it says that Enoch walked with God and he was not for God took him. And some other verses say that he was translated. What's translated. So if you think about uh 1960s Star Trek, when they got beamed away. In essence, God said, hey, you've been walking with me. Just keep walking with me. And Enoch got translated from a mortal to an immortal person and able to walk with God and see it. Now, one of the reasons that we get translated is, now let's think about a guy named Moses. And if you guys have watched the movie, The Ten Commandments, uh, with Charlton Heston doing going to town with Yul Brenner, the, who was Pharaoh. And after the uh, crossing the Red Sea, which we discussed about four shows back, the real Moses, and also portrayed by Charlton Heston, they wanted he wants to see God, show me God. And God says, I can't show myself to you because if I did, you'd go poof. But I'll tell you what, Moses, I'm going to hide you here in the cleft of the rocks. I'm going to cover you with my hand. And then I'll pass by and you'll get to see a bit of my glory. So tides in the rock. God passes by, covers up Moses, but the glow affects Moses. And when he comes down from the mountain, he's lit up in the supernatural glow. The Bible says that Moses, because he's probably scaring or freaking out, uh, all the Hebrews out there in the desert, because here he comes, you know, shining white as light. So later on in the New Testament, what happens with Enoch and Moses? Carrie, you remember? With Moses? Yeah, Enoch and Moses. No. Refresh my okay. memory. Jesus takes, as we say, memory is the second thing to go, and I can't <laughs> remember what's first. Hey, I'm 52 now. <laughs> <laughs> What'd you say? But... <laughs> Jesus takes, he had 12 apostles, and most of the time when he's going to do something, he takes three three of them with him. And who, who was that? Peter, James, and John. Yep. So were they the troublemakers? Were they the bad kids? You know, or were they guys that Jesus knew they needed to see this extra stuff? Hmm. And right before this episode in the Bible, Jesus says that some of you shall not taste death till you see the glory of God. Yeah. So they go up to this mountain top. And I want to say it's, it's either Mount Hor Hermon or Mount Horeb. That's where my memory goes on this one. Mm. And suddenly Jesus is transformed. It's the, the Mount of Transfiguration. And Peter is like, James and John are sitting there watching. And Jesus suddenly starts shining bright. And there's Enoch and Moses. Well, how does Peter, James, and John know these guys that lived a thousand and two thousand years before who they are? And Peter, like, Lord, we'll we'll build you three tabernacles here. We'll make you know, we'll build three little booths for you. And then what do you hear? Then the voice of God says, This is my beloved son, listen to him. And all of a sudden, whoop, 
there goes the the bright light and it's just Jesus there. Imagine being there while I'm experiencing you know, the, you've the been glory. following Jesus for like three and a half or probably two years now, you know, eating that with point. him, having a relationship with him, and then he takes you to a mountaintop and next thing you know you see Moses and I believe it was Elijah, right? It could have been Elijah. Yeah. Moses, Moses, Elijah, Enoch, whoever it was, you know, and Peter knew who they were. Right? He knew. And that's why yeah, he said, Hey, <laughs> You know what, Gary? Um, we're talking about the rapture of the church, and you, you mentioned the Old Testament. Enoch was taken. Elijah was taken, too. You know, he didn't taste death. But those who who come on, and it's like, what are you talking about? Can you briefly explain what the who who's the church? What is the church? Okay, well, the, the church is, because I was looking at Transfiguration there, the church is made up. A lot of people think the church is a, is a building. Yeah. But the church is actually a living entity, which is made up of all the men and women and teenagers and children that believe in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, that he paid the penalty for our sins, died on the cross. He rose again and is also going to come back to get us where he, where he is. Yeah. And so he's been gone for 2000 years preparing a place for us. And there's a famous chapter, John 14 says where I go, I go to prepare a place for you in my father's house. There are many mansions. And I like that in the King James, it says mansions, it doesn't say shacks, it doesn't yeah. say double wides. It says mansions. Mm -hmm. And he's going to prepare a place for us that he can be, that we can be with him. And so when you think about, and again, the Jewishnessness of Christianity, everything that you find in the Old Testament. When a young man was going to come and take his bride, he went to prepare a place for her. And then when he came back and got her, there was noise and a tumult. And then he came and got the bride and then they had a party, uh, is, is what we would call a wedding reception today. So the church is everyone that has ever lived believing in Jesus Christ. Yeah. So the dead in the Bible, when it says there back in Thessalonians, the dead in Christ shall rise first. Those people who are believers and have died looking forward to the joyful hope. Uh, they died in, in belief and are waiting to be resurrected. The Bible there says that there's going to be a time where people who are alive, Walking, working, you know, driving, flying, shopping, building, that we will be caught up in the air to meet the Lord. So that is the church known as saints. Mm -hmm. Some people will come at you and say, well, there's contradiction in the Bible because the Bible says that the gates of hell shall not prevail against the church. But then during the tribulation period, it says that this beast shall make war and overcome the saints. Hmm. Contradiction? No, because this is where we get into dispensations and different time frames and different programs in God's plan. So right now, the Bible says, Paul writes that, behold, I show you a mystery. And I think that one of those mysteries is what day did the church come into being on the day of Pentecost? Mm -hmm. If God's a God of order and there were seven Jewish feast days and the first three in the spring which include passover uh first fruits i always forget the other one there in the fall there is three feasts which is uh tabernacles uh trumpets uh and that's where yom kippur is today but you got one in the middle of the year which is pentecost and the church became the church on pentecost 50 days later what did jesus tell them go and await the helper and when the helper came, they got hit in a big way. And you see in the book of Acts, there's 18 different languages recorded that the, the people who came for that feast could hear them talking. People accuse them of being drunk. And Peter gets up and says, it's night in the, nine in the morning. We're not drunk, but we've been hit with the power of God. And then he quotes uh, the Old Testament verses about uh, your sons uh, will dream dreams. Your old men will have visions. Uh, 
that's you know going on. They got hit with the Holy Spirit. So to me, logically, God being a God of order, if the church came in on Pentecost, what's the perfect day for the rapture to happen on a Pentecost? But here's now where people get into trouble because people want to set dates yeah. for set years. Yeah. And as we talked about, we've got five minutes left. Back mm-hmm. in the day, a lot of us got saved because, let me get this down there, you know, we read The Late Great Planet Earth by Hal Lindsey. And then we had guys like Grant Jeffrey who wrote a book called The Final Warning. And Armageddon, The Point with Destiny. Then back uh, in the early, about 2005, I remember reading these, you had the Left Behind series yeah. by Tim LaHaye and Jerry Jenkins. I remember that. You have a super cool a guy who knows the Bible, Don Stewart, who's been around the Calvary Chapel forever. And I've listened to this tape and read this book a few times, 25 signs that were near the end. You had a guy that named Ray Comfort. <laughs> Russia will attack Israel. This book, I think, was from the early, 90, let's see, 1991 on this one. Don Stewart wrote a, another book, The Coming Temple. Yeah. Uh, Josh McDowell. A lot of cool stuff in in this volume one and two, Evidence that Demands a Verdict. And then a guy that I think both these guys are passed away. I enjoyed watching this guy back in the day, Saturday afternoons on TBN, was uh, Zola Levitt. And he even had a book on the rapture. Well, when this first book came back out in 1969, The Late Great Planet Earth, Hmm. it had a whole bevy of books. Uh, Hal Lindsey, another book, had 1980s, Countdown to Armageddon. We're still here. Yep. Okay, and so man. a lot of people, because it didn't happen on their time frame. That's right. Walked away from God. And that's what's so happening the, right now. People are walking right away. So here's the challenge. Here's the challenge to you out there watching us, laughing at us, mocking us in a rapture. Right. Mm-hmm. You're fulfilling Second Peter chapter 3. What says that in those days, the end, the end times, there will be scoffers saying, where's the promise of his coming? Because you've heard this from your parents or your grandparents. Or my great grandma told me the rapture is coming and nothing's happened. God is not slack concerning his promise. And it's going to happen. Yeah. And in a moment you think not, another scripture verse says, a moment you think not, the son of man cometh. So here's the challenge to you. Don't just, you know, listen to us two knuckleheads here talking. Do the homework yourself because the Bible teaches on the rapture. There is Old Testament verses, not just with Enoch, but there's one that says in Psalms, and I want to say it's in the 80s. It says, come up and hide yourself in your chambers for a little while till the indignation be passed. The church has to be gone so that the Lord can change his attention back to get his adulterous bride, Israel. Yeah. Church is the church. Israel's Israel. And a lot of people in the last 20, 40 years, uh, the pre-emergent church, or there's another word for the, uh, the other group that believe that the church has taken over the promises of Israel. Mm -hmm. So the church is the church and Israel's Israel mutually exclusive. And we have to be removed so that God can finish off the program uh to get them back and, and the bible says that they will and so if in in the new testament first thessalonians chapter four read your bibles open up your bibles today first thessalonians chapter four verses 13 and 18 um paul's writing about the rapture here he's this is a comfort you know the rapture is a comfort and i read in scripture that you know, the church, why would Jesus allow his church to go through a time of wrath? It should be comfort. And when I hear about the rapture, that brings comfort to me. Because I know anytime, when I listen to the news, we're listening to all, remember that book that you showed, Russia. Remember by um, Russia Trump. Attacks. Well, what's on the news today? Russia, Ukraine. Russia, Russia, Russia. There it is right there. Russia attacks Israel. Well, yesterday I heard I read that Russia is getting ready to attack 
the Middle East. Are we close? Yes. Are we close to this prophetic event? Yes. But no man knows the day or the hour. Next time we're gonna we're gonna we're, we're there's gonna be a part two on the rapture of the church, and we're gonna talk about more guys. All right, this should bring hope to you. This should bring comfort. The rapture, Jesus is coming. Well, till next time. All right, Gary. Till Thank next you. time, we're gonna be talking more about the rapture of the church. God bless you guys. God bless you all.